I'm really excited to be here today. Um, so the work that I'm going to present today is really a lab group effort. So right now, as Tao mentioned, I'm a postdoctoral research scholar at Stanford University, and I'm working with David Lobel. Um, and what we're doing is we're trying to figure out ways to translate what we see from remote sensing into actual yields and crop statistics on the ground. And Earth Engine has been really invaluable for allowing us to scale up the different algorithms that we develop. And we'd really like to thank Tao and Eric Engel for their help with our work. All right, so I'm not going to belabor the point about why we care about agricultural statistics, but if we can really map yields well, both through space and time, then one, we can identify where we might have some low yielding regions where we need to target interventions to improve food security moving, uh, moving into the future. And second, if we can identify what factors are associated with different yield trends through time, like different weather variables or different management and policy practices, we can identify ways to actually target interventions on the ground to improve food security. So to date, a lot of work has relied primarily on agricultural census statistics from governments or different ministries. But what we're trying to do is figure out a way to use remote sensing data to map these different statistics. And the benefits of using remote sensing data are that typically census statistics are often inaccurate. If they're even available, we know that in a lot of regions across the globe, particularly in smallholder farming systems, we may not even have good statistics to begin with. Uh, these statistics are typically coarse, so we might only be able to get them at, say, the district or state level, whereas we might want to actually map individual fields or get fine scale resolution. And collecting data on the ground is very time and cost intensive. So by using satellites, this is a way to actually map these different parameters at fairly low cost. So we think this is a really exciting time for mapping satellite or mapping yields using satellites for three different reasons. One is that there's been a big increase in the amount of satellite data that has become available. This is through both NASA, which has, um, here's a graph just showing the number of missions from NASA in each decade. And you can see that in our current decade, we have about two times or more the number of missions than any previous era. So this is really an exciting time where we have a lot more data available. In addition to NASA, we're getting a lot of additional data sets from private organizations like Digital Globe, and also new micro and nano satellite companies like Skybox and Planet Labs. So this is really an exciting, exciting time to be using satellite data. The second is thanks to Google Earth Engine, we now have the computational tools at our disposal to actually do these analyses at really big scales. So I unfortunately have only been using Earth Engine for a little over a year, but I wish I had been one of the early users three years ago. You guys could have shaved three years off my PhD, I think. So um, I'm not going to belabor this point either, because Rebecca gave a very great introduction of everything that you can do with Earth Engine. But one thing that we've been really excited about is the ability to use uh, Google Earth Engine to really easily create these cloud-free mosaics. So here's an example of a Landsat tile from where I'm working in northern India in Bihar. And you can see right here, there's a lot of cloud cover, which makes the bottom of this image pretty unusable. Here's another image about two weeks later from the same growing season. Now you have a clear part at this bottom of the scene, but you end up having cloud cover at the top. So what we can do with Earth Engine within the matter of minutes is seamlessly mosaic these two and pick the best pixel that has the lowest cloud score and then create this tile that's fairly cloud free, which increases the area that we can actually do our analyses. And finally, the third thing that we need to actually map yields from space are robust algorithms where we can actually translate the vegetation indices that we see from satellites into actual yield estimates on the ground. And today I'm going to talk about a method that our group has developed called SKIM. It's Scalable Crop Yield Mapper. David likes to make a joke that the way to remember it is actually you can say that Stephen Curry is your MVP. He's a big Golden State Warriors fan. I don't know if you guys followed the finals. Um, but I try not to use that too much because I'm a Midwesterner and I'm a big LeBron James fan. So, All right, so to date, we've applied this algorithm in three different regions. We developed it first in the US, where we have really great field level data to actually validate our models. One thing I should say is the reason that our method is so scalable is we actually don't require any sort of calibration data to calibrate our model. Um, and because of this, we can actually run it in regions where we don't have very good ground data, which is most places around the world. 
So I'll show you some initial results, uh, which are pretty good from the US, from the Corn Belt in the US. Then I'll show you some preliminary results from northern India and also some results from Zambia, where we also have some ground data for validation. So here's just an example of a Landsat cloud-free mosaic overlay of um, agricultural fields in the Corn Belt in the US. And what we essentially want to do is translate this greenness, these greenness measures we're seeing from satellites into yields. But there's a lot of complexity in doing this because each of these different fields may have different management practices like different sow dates, different crop cultivars. They may experience different weather, have different soil types. And there's a lot of heterogeneity that makes it difficult to just create a very linear one-to-one -one relationship between a VI and, and yield. So what we do, um, we don't have crop valid, uh, field level validation data, but instead we kind of create this uh, calibration data, but we create this calibration data using simulations from crop models. So I'll do this again. We're gonna go into our crop model simulation world now represented, represented by these cartoons. So specifically we use the crop model APSUM. This is a product that we've really worked with for the past few years and really like. But there's no reason to think that this wouldn't work if we use different crop models. So basically what a crop model is, is it's a mathematical representation of crop growth through time. And what you do is you input a variety of different management practices or parameters that you think represent the fields over the region where you want to map yields. So for example, you might pick certain seed cultivars that you think are representative of your region. You control for different irrigation factors. So if it's a rain-fed system, you turn irrigation off. If you think that there is irrigation involved, you add different irrigation parameters. You can control the amount of fertilizer that you add. You input different weather parameters. And this is just a subset of the different factors that you can uh, consider within our model. But I just wanted to give you an example. And then what do we get from this? So we input all of these different management factors for this individual farmer, this individual field, and then what we get is an output of yields for that given farmer or field, and also crop growth through time, so a measure of LAI or biomass for each day throughout the crop growth cycle. And then what we do is because of that initial heterogeneity, if you remember that original map that I showed you, we don't just run the simulation for one farmer and one type of management, we run it for 50 or 100 different farmers that incorporate or encompass the range of management strategies in the region of interest. And what we then get are these nice phenologies of crop growth represented by LAI on the y-axis through time, which is on the x-axis. And each of these different lines represents each of these individual farmer simulations that we created. So um, once again, each of these simulations span various sites, years, so dates, so densities, just a variety of different management practices. And um, just in a very kind of basic sense, what you can see is these really high LAI simulations are typically ones that result in high yields. These low simulations are one that result in low yields. And what we can do is say you have an image date from August you can create some sort of relationship where if you know the LAI on August 1st, you can then convert that to yield. Unfortunately, with satellites, we can't measure directly things like LAI. Instead, we get vegetation indices or measures of greenness on the ground. But there has been a lot of research done that's looked at the relationship between LAI and different VIs. So we can actually translate what we're seeing from remote sensing into what we're getting from the crop model outputs. So here's just an example of a VI that we really like that we've found great success with. This is CL Green. And you can see that there's a fairly nice linear relationship between LAI and CL Green, meaning we can very easily translate the CL Green we see from our satellites into LAI. Then what we do is we run regressions using just the APSUM crop simulation data, where we predict the estimated yield from our model based on the LAI on a given day, the weather on a given day. And through that, we get these beta coefficients from our linear regressions. And then we take those and actually apply them to the VIs that we see from our satellites. I know I went through that a little bit quickly, so I'd be happy to talk to you about this more um, at the upcoming break. 
But the main uh, benefit of this strategy is that if you remember when we create these cloud-free composites, not all of the pixels are coming from the same date of image. So what this method allows us to do is actually come up with different beta coefficients for different dates of pixels or different dates of VIs from our satellite image analysis. So now we can really utilize every pixel within that cloud-free composite and not have to rely on just one date of analysis. And then using these date-specific regressions, we can then apply them at a per pixel level using Google Earth Engine. All right, so what do these look like? Here are some results for rain-fed systems of maize in Iowa. And this is just showing yields mapped from 2008 to 2013. Cooler values are represented in blue, and those are lower yielding regions. And then the hotter red colors represent higher yielding regions. And you can see that there's a lot of variability both across space and through time and yields. Okay, so so far I've mostly shown you simulations. How well are these actually doing? When we validated these data, they actually are doing fairly well. So here we're validating our estimate, which is on the x-axis, the skim estimate of yield. And on the y-axis is our actually observed or reported yield at the field level. And you can see that most of our results stay fairly close to this one-to-one -one line, meaning that our estimates are doing pretty well. And the correlation values range from about 0.5 to 0.7. So they're not perfect. But given that you don't need any sort of calibration data and this is really easily scalable, this is encompassing a lot of the variation that you would need to kind of pick out low yielding or high yielding regions or change in trends and yield through time. So another thing that's really exciting with Google Earth Engine is we don't all only get these sort of district level statistics. Instead, we can also get more localized field level maps of yields. So this is just showing an output that we did for individual fields within the same rain-fed system in Iowa. And you can export your geotiffs, import them into Google Earth, and actually look at changes in yield at the field scale in a very interactive, uh, fine scale way. So now what we're working on is figuring out how generalizable the skim algorithm is. Hopefully I've convinced you that we did a pretty good job mapping rain-fed maize um, in the US Corn Belt. But how well does this work in other systems? So once again, the motivation behind this question was that we really wanted to use remote sensing to map yields in areas where we might not necessarily have great ground data. And oftentimes, these regions overlap with areas that are primarily smallholders. So this means farm sizes are typically two hectares or smaller. And with anyone who's tried to map agriculture using remote sensing, you know that smallholder farms are typically finer than the resolution of a Landsat pixel, which leads to problems of mixed pixels. And um, this could reduce our accuracy. The second issue is some of these regions also have a lot of mixed crop types. So unlike the Corn Belt in the US, where you can more or less see wall-to-wall -wall maize, in some of these regions, you might have different crops being planted next to one another. So how well do our algorithms work when you have these mixed cropping systems? And then finally, we wanted to see how well we can map other things other than yield. So from our APSIM output models, we also get things like SODATE, and other crop parameters. So we want to see if using these same methods, we can map other factors that might be important for food security, like sodates. So this is the work that I'm taking uh, the lead on. So we're focusing on mapping wheat yields in northern India. So this is the wheat belt in India that provides about 80% of India's wheat. Wheat is about 20% of caloric intake in India. So you can see that this is really an important region for food security for India moving forward. And what we've done to date, so the results right now are fairly preliminary, but um, we wanted to once again see how well these algorithms work in smallholder systems. So just to show you that issue of mixed pixels that I talked about earlier in a more visual way, here's just an image of this region that we're working in in northeastern India and in Bihar. And you can see the images are fairly small. This is from Google Earth Engine. And when we overlay Landsat pixels on top of it, you can see that an individual field or an individual pixel might be covered by a few different fields. You might have some fields that are so small that they're not even covered fully by a Landsat pixel. Uh, so this, you can imagine, creates a lot of mixed pixel problems. 
So what we've done is we've tried to map SODATE, and these are just maps of SODATE just to show you some preliminary results in this region in India. Once again, cool colors represent earlier SODATES, hot colors represent later SODATES, and we're doing this through time. So you can see that there's, once again, a lot of variability through space and time. Finally, the third region that we're testing this in is Zambia, and this is another area where we have a lot of great ground data to validate our models. The issue here is we have a lot of different crops being planted within the same uh, area, so we're having this problem of mixed crop type that could be affecting our algorithm. So just to show you what this looks like, here's a, a picture from Google Earth, and you can see these really round fields, these represent irrigated maize. These more rectangular fields that are a little bit more regular in shape, those are rain-fed maize. So you can imagine that we likely would have to apply different algorithms to map yield in the rain-fed versus the irrigated farms. So we wanted to see, can we actually map these systems and, and apply these algorithms? So first we looked at existing data products to see if we could use them to actually map rain-fed versus irrigated systems. This is one existing data product, and you can see that this doesn't really pick out those circular irrigated fields very well. This is a second existing data product. This also wasn't doing a really great job. So George Azari, who's the postdoc taking a lead on this, I'm sure many of you know him from the Help Forum or previous Earth Engine uh, conferences, is taking the lead on this. And what he's done is actually developed his own classification to disentangle irrigated versus rain-fed systems. And the way he did this was he created four-year deep seasonal mosaics for November and January, <coughs> February to April, May to July, and August to October. And he took the median NDVI value for each of these pixels. And then he ran a decision tree, decision tree classification. And we'll zoom in and see how well his classification does. So once again, this is what the image actually looks like. And this is what the classification looks like. So you can see that this is doing a much better job where we can pick out these more irrigated round, round systems and then the uh, more rain-fed maize systems. So once again, this is just preliminary. What we're going to do next is then apply the skim algorithms to rain-fed versus irrigated fields and see how well our algorithm does. So in summary, we think that we're at a really exciting time to be using satellites to map yields. And this is, again, for three reasons. We're getting a lot of different satellite products, not only from NASA, but from different private companies. And these data products are starting to be available at higher and higher spatial resolutions, where in smallholder farming systems, this is really exciting, because this is going to get away from that problem of mixed pixels that I'm sure we've all been dealing with for the past few years. Uh, Google Earth Engine is a really valuable tool that allows us to scale up our results so we no longer have to rely on one computer doing an analysis for 15 years. We can actually split it across multiple processors and do something within a few minutes. And then finally, we're getting access to new robust algorithms such as SKIM that will actually allow us to translate what we're seeing from remote sensing, i.e. the vegetation indices, into real world characteristics on the ground like yield or so date. So thanks so much. I'd love any questions that you might have. Yeah, so that's a great question. As I mentioned, our data products or our algorithm is only able to uh, get about 50 to 70% of the, the correlation between VIs and yield. So right now, we're not necessarily incorporating uncertainty. But I think moving forward, when we actually take these data products to uh, local organizations on the ground who might be using these for actual interventions, we might include some uncertainty estimates around our yield predictions to say, OK, we think the yield here is three tons, but we're only 70% sure of this certainty, so that we make sure that we're providing policymakers with all the information that they need to make informed decisions. Whether you're also differentiating the crops, the different crops, and how you do it. 
Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, in the US and in the Indian case studies, we didn't really have to focus so much on crop type because the regions where we're working, if you see a crop, it's most likely going to be maize or it's most likely going to be wheat. So there we're mostly creating masks that are either agriculture or agriculture or non-ag, and we've luckily been able to mostly do that just using ma maximum NDVI to differentiate between agriculture and other land covers. The area where this does become an issue, once again, is the Zambia case study, and there we found that this median NDVI approach is actually working well to distinguish between at least rain-fed and irrigated systems. But that's something, depending on the area where you work, that's something that you might need to do before you apply these algorithms, is actually map crop type. Uh, seems like the the yield mapping seems so empirical and you know just for the rain fed. Have you looked into implementing more dynamic crop growth model rather than a simple empirical equation that those beta coefficients cannot be transferable from year to year? And like this had type of models. And the second question, I was just wondering. Uh, and maybe I missed it. What are some of the data layers that you guys have been using to differentiate uh, dry land from the irrigated? Have you looked into use of water consumption? That's that's very critical input. If you're gonna, you know, create a map that tells you whether that's a irrigated versus dry land. I mean, without such information, I think it, it will be not really robust? Yeah, OK, those are two great questions. So for the first question, um, you asked about how we can incorporate or think about interannual variability. And what, dynamic. Or dynamic. And what we've found is that actually, if we include weather in our models, which does vary from year to year, that really increases the R squareds from our yield prediction. So even though our beta coefficients are staying the same kind of through time, just incorporating the weather parameters add in a lot of accuracy. And also, we would imagine, right, so we're trying to keep it for the crop type that we know. So we do do crop classifications before running these algorithms. Um, and we're hoping that a lot of that other underlying heterogeneity will actually be reflected in the VI. So if we have a low yielding region with poor soils, hopefully we'll see low VIs. And because of that, that'll directly translate to low yields. So we might not know the exact mechanism that's leading to low yields, but hopefully by translating that VI into yields, we can actually get the proper estimate. Like soybean and corn have the same AAI mm -hmm. and DVI. One yield, you know, soybean is 4,000 kilogram per hectare versus, you know, the other one is 12 to 15,000. How, how right. do you separate these differences if you don't know what the crop is? Right. No, that's a great question. So I should have made it clear. We actually rerun these algorithms for different crop types. So we have different beta coefficients for soybean, different beta coefficients for maize, different beta coefficients for wheat. And then after applying a crop mask or using an existing crop mask, we'll apply the correct beta coefficient for that crop type to get yield. And we've actually uh, validated. So here I showed results for just rain-fed maize. But we've tried this for irrigated maize, rain-fed soybean, and irrigated soybean. And we actually get similar R squareds. So we feel pretty confident that our, that our method is pretty um, flexible. Yeah, so that's a great question. So in terms of the remote sensing data uh, for VIs, we've primarily been using Landsat. But now we're starting to use other products like Skybox to see if they can be applied to different data sets. In terms of weather, we've been using Prism and Daymet. Um, in India, we're struggling to figure out what the best thing to use is, thinking about using Trim or Aphrodite. But yeah, I'd love to chat with you if you have other ideas. Yeah. Thanks so much.